Hi everyone, welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman, and I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm truly honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Friday, July 9th, 2021. And in this week's episode, I'm super excited to present this conversation I recently had with Jason Slaughter, the creative genius behind the phenomenal YouTube channel, Not Just Bikes, that has exploded onto the scene in the past two years. Now, if you could choose to live anywhere, anywhere in the world, where would that be? Well, that was the choice that Jason, his wife, and their young Canadian family were pondering a couple years ago. They ended up choosing to live in Amsterdam. And very soon after that, he launched the Not Just Bikes YouTube channel as a way of explaining why they made this choice. And surprise, apparently a lot of people, and when I say a lot of people, we're talking 200,000 subscribers with millions of views. So yes, a lot of people seem to be quite interested in the various topics from the mundane to the fascinating that Jason presents. We'll dive into that content and what he thinks might be going on. But before we roll into those discussions, please allow me a moment to mention that this episode is once again being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. And with nearly $200 in donations since our last week's episode, I just wanted to say that I am so incredibly grateful. Now, if you too would like to pitch in and help promote this movement, please head over to my website at activetowns.org and simply navigate to the donation page. However, if making a donation is just not an option right now, no worries. I completely understand and I have good news. You can still help me out in a very big way by spreading the word about Active Towns and this podcast. The bigger the tent, the better. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you can send my way as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity. And as always, one final reminder before we get started. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to, rate, and review the Active Towns podcast on your preferred listening platform, as this helps connect others to this content. Thanks. Okay, enough bantering about here. Let's get this conversation about not just bikes with Jason Slaughter rolling. Very good. Well, hey, Jason, it's so wonderful to connect with you here today. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Thanks. Hey, uh, you know, hey, first off, thank you so very much. I know it's very late (laughs) for you. At least, you know, you're you're it's late for you in the evening. It's like (laughs) after uh, nine o'clock at night, I believe. And uh, usually I'm uh, I'm retiring and going to bed. Are are you a night owl? Do you? uh... Uh, uh, Yes, that's an understatement. Uh, I actually have a circadian rhythm disorder, so I'll be up very late. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, that that probably answers uh, a, another question as to how on earth do you get this stuff done? Now I know yeah. you, you. No, no, no. I started. Late. I started after the kids go to bed, and I'll uh, I'll finish each night at like four a.m. or something like that. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, hey, let's let's kick this off by just a quick introduction. Uh, tell the mm-hmm. audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. My name is Jason Slaughter. Uh, I'm a Canadian who now lives in the Netherlands, and I run a YouTube channel called Not Just Bikes that has become unexpectedly popular. Let's put it that way. Um, so that's the quick intro. I can give a very long story, but you know that's up to you. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great <laughs> intro. So, uh, and, and I think we've established that a lot of the stuff you're doing at night. Uh, do you have a daytime job too, or? Um, I did, but I actually was uh, uh, taking a career break to be a stay-at-home dad, and um, and then Corona hit, and all the contracts that I was doing dried up, and uh, yeah, so now I guess I'm a YouTuber. For well, now. you are a you are a YouTube <laughs> star. <laughs> That's great. So let's go let's go back to the origins mm. of getting this started uh, because mm-hmm. it hasn't been that long. Uh, and no, it's you... been less than two years. It's been about a yeah. year and a half. Fantastic. So uh, let's go to the origin story. Why why start uh, a YouTube channel? And I think it started on Twitter first, right? Uh, yeah, in a way. I mean, it's it, I mean, it's a very very long story, but I'll try to condense it. Um, and I don't need to go in. Well, I may want to talk about some of the history of what led up to all this, but 
the short of it is that um uh oh how do i start short you know the the thing is my wife and i have lived all over the world um and uh we lived in the uk we lived in taiwan we lived in uh belgium i've lived in the us as as well um and we've traveled a lot my wife has been to 60 countries i've been to 59 um I used to travel a, a lot for business, to say the least. And uh, this is all relevant, trust me. <laughs> and um, I uh, traveled more than anybody should ever travel. Like there was about a five year period where I wasn't in the same time zone for more than about three weeks. So uh, I used to see how different places were and how, how people lived in different places. And I did a lot of business travel. So I was, I wasn't going to touristy places. I was going to the places where people actually lived and worked. And so I had this experience in all these different places around the world. And, um, and I started getting interested into like why these places were different. Um, and on like, why is it that, you know, I, I really enjoyed going to Seoul in South Korea, or I loved going to Taipei in Taiwan. Um, and I loved living there. Um, but then I would go to say like uh, Dallas or Phoenix or Houston, and uh, and I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, that's how I sort of got started into urban planning. But um, what happened with us eventually is we had uh, we had some kids. We had our first child in the UK, our second in Belgium, and we decided, you know what? I think it's time maybe to stop gallivanting around the world and we move back to Canada. And uh, that was interesting because reverse culture shock is actually a thing. Like it really, really is. And uh, and so we we went back to Toronto. And after about a year, I was like, I'm done with this. I can't live here, man. <laughs> it was it was a lot of different things. But uh, with respect to the urban planning type stuff, it was a bit of a shock to be going be going from all of these walkable places that we lived back to a a relatively car dependent society. And Toronto's better than most for what it's worth. Um, and it was, it was just too much. But then my wife said, look, you know, if we're moving, we're not moving again. Like this has got to be it. Right. So you have to, you have to be done. So we set ourselves on a mission to decide like, where is the best place for us in the world to live? And, uh, we did a lot of research. Um, uh, I, we looked back to the places that we've enjoyed, um, traveling to the places that I've been to on business, the places we've lived, of course. And uh, we shortlisted them when then, you know, we even visited some of these places. We would stay in an Airbnb for two weeks and pretended that we lived there. And eventually, you know, long story short, we ended up in Amsterdam. Um, and that's ultimately where the channel comes from, because all of that research about why we thought the Netherlands was the best country for us. Um, really, I wanted to share that with other people. So I was sharing that on Twitter for a while. But uh, really, like, you know, as, as we briefly talked about before the show, you really need to show people things uh, in order for them to get it. Because you can, you can talk about it all you want, but you ha a lot of this stuff, like, I didn't appreciate it until I experienced it for myself, until I, like, went there for myself and looked around and was like, wow, look at this, look at this is the way people live. This is crazy. I can't, I can't believe this is a thing. Um, so I wanted to show that to people, and Twitter was very limiting in the amount of... Um, video time that you can have 140 seconds and and so i thought you know I'll, I'll start a youtube channel but the the intention of the channel was only to explain the question that we were getting all the time people would say why would you move from canada to the netherlands like well, canada's a great country especially you know we'd have american friends that would ask us that because you know every time something goes wrong in american politics the google searches for how to move to canada just skyrocket right so Canada <laughs> has this sort of like aura of like, this is the promised land. This is where there, nothing ever goes wrong. This is where we move when <laughs> things go bad. And you left it voluntarily. Um, and Canadian people would ask like, well, you know, wait, you know, I know you lived all over the place, but why, why are you moving there? And Dutch people here would ask us, well, why, why would you leave? So the whole point of the channel was to, uh, to explain why we moved from Canada to the Netherlands. And it was only supposed to be, you know, 10 or 12 videos. There were, there were a bunch of things that, um, uh, that we wanted, uh, that I specifically wanted to talk about, you know, independence for children and the, the safe streets. And, you know, uh, there, there's a variety. Well, it's basically the first 10 or 12 videos on my channel. Um, and that was the intention and that was it. And, you know, as I said, in the first video, uh, a lot of people assume when they think about the Netherlands or they think about Amsterdam, they just think about the bicycles. 
And that's what Amsterdam is famous for, right, is the bicycles. But it's so much more than that. And when you learn about the history of Amsterdam, it wasn't, they weren't trying to build a cycling city. Um, they were just trying to make their streets safer. And the cycling came out of it. And so that's where the name of the channel comes from. Because as I said at the end of the first video, there's a lot of good reasons why Dutch cities are so great. And it's not just bikes. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the story. It was really supposed to be the explanation about why, why we moved here. Uh, and, and it has become quite a bit more than that kind of unexpectedly. Right. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, Toronto in, in that area. Were you in Toronto proper or just outside yes. of Toronto? No, we okay. were. We actually um, managed to uh, move to a, uh, a place called Riverdale, which I actually featured in a video a couple of weeks ago about suburbs that don't suck, um, about the way the, that um, North American cities used to build suburbs 100 years ago. Um, and it's so funny because I'm still getting comments from people saying, Riverdale's not a suburb. Suburbs are these places with, you know, with, with nothing but houses and, the, and they, you don't mix in, you can't have like, like uh, mixed in um, uh, commercial districts and suburbs. That's not what a suburb is, buddy. And I'm like, no, you, you're really totally missing the point. That's literally what a suburb was until about 70 years ago. Um, suburbs were like their own contained little town that were walkable that, uh, you know, anyway. Uh, we well, they, pre they, they actually technically predate the automobile. Yes, of course. Yeah. Suburbs have been around as long as cities have been around. Um, I mean, they're even, um, they're even Roman suburbs. Um, right. So, and certainly the, the earliest modern suburbs were connected by train to London, England. Um, so certainly um, a, a suburb and, and the same thing happened in the US. I mean, most of the cities in the, in the US that other than right on the East Coast were built around, um, well, by railroad uh, companies around, uh, around a train station. And they were their own towns and, you know, you'd take the train to where you were going. And once you were there, you'd walk to where you wanted to go. Yeah, yeah. So your story is just slightly different than uh, Chris and Melissa's, you know, fellow mm -hmm. Canadians that uh, uh, get that same question from their <laughs> their friends yeah. and family uh, yeah. in Canada that say, well, why would you move to the Netherlands? And of course, for them, it was because they were given that opportunity. They were offered jobs and they had... Uh, had already written their first book uh, about right. you know Dutch cycling and and, and the Netherlands. Uh, in, in your case, it sounds like you you had that question in mind of where's the best place for us to go, and yeah. it sounds like the globe was your option. You you basically said where would we like to go, and you probably had some criteria. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking the English language, you know, in other words, being in a place where it felt comfortable. Uh, to to exist, you know, and, and not be, you know, completely, you know, feeling. Uh, like that wasn't you're... too much of a consideration for us, to be honest. We were willing to to learn it. We were considering Denmark and and Norway and places like that. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, we had the luxury of being able to move just about anywhere because, um, I mean, both my wife and I are are professionals that were fairly far in our career, but also we both had international experience, and so it's still very hard to convince a company across the world or in another country to hire you and, 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 you know, go through the painful process of getting you residency permits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I don't want to trivialize. It's difficult even for us, but it's easier for us than for most people because of the international experience we already had. So, you know, if, if I'm going to them and saying like, look, you know, I've, I've lived in Taiwan and managed teams there and managed remote teams back in the UK and things like that. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot easier sell, let's put it that way. Um, but ultimately, um, it was my wife that got the job first. I had interviewed with uh, a few different companies, but just couldn't quite make it come together uh, that, uh, that I was interested in or that they were interested or that the deal worked out properly. So yeah, she was the one that ultimately got the job. Which is why I could work contract and then later uh, and be a stay-at-home dad for a while, which is obviously also a luxury yeah. that we have. So let's let's dive into the the channel itself and uh, uh, l let's talk a little bit about you. You alluded to it a little in in saying that you know it's become a success. How yeah. successful has this become? Um, it's become kind of ridiculously successful. <laughs> Um, so I, I just passed, um, 170,000 subscribers, um, uh, last week, I think it was. 
So let's put that into context, you know, for, for creators, uh, how easy is it to, you know, to hit some of the, the key milestones? Yeah. So YouTube says that, uh, so I read all this when I was starting out, um, YouTube says that the average channel now keep in mind, this also includes like some kid that just starts streaming his Minecraft and it's not taking it seriously, but the average channel, uh, that reaches 1000 subscribers will do it in 22 months. And uh, I hit 1,000 subscribers in um, about six weeks. And, um, and then 100,000 subscribers just, just after the, the one-year point. Um, so it's been unusually rapid growth. It's, it's certainly not the fastest growing YouTube channel around. I mean, it's not like Mr. Beast or something like that. But, uh, but it has grown much faster than I expected. Because when I started, I did basically no market research. I think if I had, I probably wouldn't have started because I would have looked and I said, you know, there's other channels that do other urban planning stuff and you know, the, what am I adding to it? I, but <laughs> so I'm just kind of glad I didn't do any research. Um, but again, it was only supposed to be a little, you know, side project for fun to, to explain to people to, to pass the videos to. But if I looked at, for instance, Bicycle Dutch, which had, I think uh, when I started about 30,000 subscribers and, and, um, a great channel, by the way, obviously, you know, Bicycle Dutch, um, Mark. Um, but he had been doing it for 12 years. So that's kind of what I thought. Like eventually I'll taper out at about 30,000 subscribers. And, you know, after I've been doing this for a while, if I continue it, you know, that's, that's kind of what I thought. And that's not what happened. So it's interesting to see how it progressed because, um, a, f a few months in, so it, I started in, in October and in, in January, uh, the, the channel got monetized and, um, and then, you know, YouTube makes their money off of ads. So they're not really going to promote a channel unless they can make money off of it. So once you've been monetized, then YouTube's algorithm suddenly cares about you. And they started promoting the channel to uh, people in the Netherlands, <clears throat> which is what they do because I was physically in the Netherlands. Google knew that. And so they promoted it to people in the Netherlands. Um, and I got what I really didn't expect was that Dutch people love the channel because they didn't know this stuff. They didn't know that this stuff was special. Uh, they had no idea. And that had never occurred to me. It should have because, you know, I never thought about urban planning before uh, before a few years ago. So it was, why would you ever think of these things? So uh, it became very, very popular uh, with Dutch people. And until very recently, until just the last few months, um, uh, the Netherlands was still by far the top uh, demographic for the channel. And, you know, I, w I was interviewed on local radio. I, I had a, a two page spread in the in the Dutch uh, national newspaper. And, uh, and it was actually kind of crazy how how much Dutch people were interested in the channel. And I think that's really interesting, because people don't well, one thing I've learned about this is people know nothing about urban planning, they really don't. And people all have their assumptions about things, they all assume that, first of all, things that everyone assumes is that the way it is where they live is where it is everywhere, or it's similar. And if it isn't, it's because of some obvious thing, like, the culture or the weather or the terrain or something like that. Like it's always this assumption that, well, that's def different there because of those conditions they must have. And obviously it's like this here because of the conditions we live in. Um, and I, and I think that's the level of understanding that most people have about city design. And, and I think that goes for anywhere. And I'm sure you've experienced that too with, with Americans who say, you know, we're not Amsterdam or something like that. And um, it's, and it's, uh, it's just, it's funny. It's, it's really funny to, to sort of fall into this because obviously this wasn't my intention. And then the second, um, big spike that I've had is fairly recently because after I did that first year, I was sort of done, right? I was done. Like, this is the reason why we moved to the Netherlands. This is it. Um, but then I started thinking, okay, well, you know, there's, there's people obviously interested in these topics and I'm interested in these topics or, or I wouldn't have learned this stuff in the first place. But one of the things that was important to me was learning a lot of these urban planning fundamentals that, you know, like I said, most people don't give this uh, a second's thought. And uh, so I thought, okay, so the next year of this channel, I'm uh, sort of season two, if you will, I'm going to make it about urban planning fundamentals. So if you look at the channel, you'll see that each, each video, um, you know, it normally tells a story of something that I've done in my life or experienced but it introduces some kind of urban planning concept. Uh, you know, what, whether it be the missing middle or something like that, or, uh, you know, what, whatever it might be. Uh, and, um, 
And that's been really interesting as well. But one of the things I really wanted to do was talk about strong towns. And, you know, you're familiar with strong towns. And I think most of your uh, audience aren't. But if you aren't, geez, it's just, I mean, pause the play, <laughs> the podcast and go check out strong towns. But anyway, um, uh, and strong towns is all about the financial viability of cities. And that was one of those things that was really eye opening for me when I saw it, because I found that back in 2013 or something like that. And, um, and the, so I decided I'd make a strong towns playlist and boy, that has really, obviously I was not the only one that, that was, had their eyes open by strong towns because that has just taken the channel to a whole other level and, um, introducing concepts from strong towns, such as the growth Ponzi scheme or the Strode has, has really captured people's imaginations. And I think it's the same thing that I had. It's that, you know, I had no idea that the way that roads are designed in the US and Canada is different than it is in other countries. And it it's for specific historical reasons and, and a, a particular approach to a car centric approach to design that doesn't have to be that way. And, and it's really fascinating. And so that this is what I want to, now that I have this platform, I want to introduce people to these concepts so they can learn more about how cities are actually designed and the history around why these places are like this and what things used to be like where they live and where other people live and hopefully provide some some uh some context and some understanding for them to uh well quite frankly to find the place that that they want to live either to improve the place they live in now or move somewhere else right right so you'd mentioned that you really hadn't thought about ur urban planning, you know, before. Mm -hmm. uh, what was what was that aha moment that got you thinking about urban planning? <laughs> There's a story there, <laughs> and I'm actually working on a video about this very thing. So it it happened at a very specific time, and it's funny because I clearly remember the moment it happened. So I was on a business trip. I was on one of my many round the world trips, like literally on one of those round the world tickets. Um, where, you know, you have to travel just east or just west and, and you can get it on a single fare. So I was doing a business trip that was hitting up, I don't know what it was, six or seven cities around the world. And I was uh, doing it with, uh, with this one leg uh, in the U.S. I was doing with a couple of coworkers. And so I was in Houston. I was in the suburbs of Houston. Uh, I'm not a fan of Houston. Um, but anyway, um, I was in the suburbs of Houston and um, we had one rental car between the three of us and the uh, we had no meetings for the rest of the day. And the guys took off to go to something. I don't remember what it was, but they took the car. Anyway, so I was at the hotel in the suburbs of Houston and I needed a new suitcase. And there happened to be a, a luggage store that was about 800 meters from the hotel. And I thought, you know, that's great. Luggage store, it actually sells the brand of luggage that I was looking for. And, uh, and I thought, fantastic. I will walk to the luggage store. I will buy a suitcase. That was my plan. And oh my God, I almost died. Like it was just, it was horrible. Like I left, I left the, um, <laughs> I left the hotel. There's no sidewalk. I walked through the parking lot to the main road, which I now know is a strode. Um, you know, so this is a five lane high speed arterial. Uh, and, um, there was a sidewalk for part of it. Um, but <clears throat> it was uncomfortable to walk there. Uh, and, um, but you know, there was a sidewalk, so, uh, so I'm walking along, I'm from London, Ontario, so I know what it's like to walk along crappy strokes. So, uh, but then I get to this, um, this railway overpass. So the, the railway was sort of sunken down and, uh, an old railway, I don't think it was in use anymore. And, um, the sidewalk just ended and the sidewalk really just became a curb that was only about 10 centimeters wide. And so I'm shimmying along this little... <laughs> the piece of concrete holding onto the guardrail as these cars are going by at 80 to hundred kilometers an hour. And at that moment, at that moment, I clearly remember myself thinking, if I live through this, I want to live in wherever the opposite of this place is. And I now live in Amsterdam. So anyway, I eventually made it to the other side. There was no sidewalk on the other side. I walked through parking lots. I made it to the luggage store. I bought my luggage and I took a taxi back 800 meters. And, um, that's stupid. Like no place should ever be designed like that, that you can't walk 800 meters without risking your life. I mean, that's just, it's, it's unbelievably stupid.
And yet these places exist all over the U.S. and Canada. And, um, and that was the moment where I was determined to like figure out like why would a place be designed such as this, such that um, you've got five lanes of traffic, you've got businesses everywhere, you've got a shopping mall nearby, you've got hotels, and you've got no way to walk. Uh, so that's actually where it all started. <laughs> Wow. in houston wow. thanks Houston. i love it i mean i, I love <laughs> yeah, it it's because actually a specific moment <laughs> it's a specific moment you know and, and mine is 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 not far off i mean <laughs> I, I i was i was just saying this earlier today um it, on uh the uh, bottom up revolution podcast with rachel oh, yeah. and and she was asking well what's your origin story how did how did active towns come about and and i said well you know it's a, it was about halfway through my career I mean, I've been doing this for about 30 years yep. and, uh, and about 15 years in, you know, I made a move. I moved from Boulder, Colorado to Honolulu, Hawaii. Oh yeah. And so I'm moving from one slice of paradise to another slice of paradise. But then I get there and it was so devastating. I couldn't ride my bike. I mean, it right. was just such a hostile environment. They literally paved over paradise. They took you know, a beautiful island, you know, Shangri-La and turned it into a, an auto hellscape. I literally sold my bike, withdrew from Ironman Canada, which was a triathlon I was supposed to be doing up in, in Penticton that year and said, I, I, I can't do this. I, I, I hmm. cannot risk my life out on these streets. I'm going to yeah. go surfing. I'm going to spend my time in the ocean. And so that really, you know, was a shift for me. Uh, in the health promotion world, which is what my background is, is is in public health, of really examining our communities, our built environment, and that to clued me into uh, urbanism and the Congress for New Urbanism. And then very soon after that, I met uh, I met uh, Chuck and Strong Towns, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest is history. I mean, in 2011, I founded my nonprofit, and then in 2012. Uh, when we sort of honed in on what we wanted to say about creating a culture of activity is when I, uh, I, I coined the term, you know, uh, active towns. And, and I reached out to Chuck, too, and I said, hey, I'm thinking about, you know, launching a new initiative as part of uh, my nonprofit, which the technical name is Advocates for Healthy Communities. And uh, I said, I'm thinking of calling it Active Towns, mainly because the URL is available. <laughs> active cities, <laughs> that wasn't available. Active communities, <laughs> that wasn't available. Active Towns was available. And he's like, yeah, I'd be honored. You should do, totally do that. And uh, one of the things that, that he and I banter around about is that a strong town is inherently an active town. Yeah, it is. You yeah, know, so Because you know, of this whole reason, this connection to mobility, active mobility. Yes. Um, you know, I mentioned to you before we got on, as soon as my camera came up, that I've got a sunburn today um, because I've been out and I forgot to put sunscreen on. Um, but, you know, I, I was out doing the things that I was doing today. Um, nothing special. It was all the stuff I had to do. And I, I just looked here that I've done 25 kilometers of cycling today. Um, that's just the cycling. It's not, it's not the walking that I've done. And, and that was not because I'm training for an Ironman. And it was not because I'm going out for exercise. That was because I needed to run errands and I had meetings in a specific place in the city and I needed to take my kid to his activities. I mean, that's it. And 25 kilometers of cycling. Uh, now it's on an e-bike, so it's not like I, you know, deserve some great applause or something for my exercise, but that's not the point. It's not about the exercise. It's about I'm staying active just by living my life. And, um, if I lived in the suburbs of Houston, uh, that would simply not be possible. Right, right. Well, it's what we call natural activity. Yeah, Your it's what I call the gym of life. Exactly, yeah. You get in that, that natural bit of activity. We, mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier, uh, Chris and Melissa, when I first met them in Vancouver, you know, I, I told them that you know, they're, they are activity ambassadors and they looked at me with a confused look and they're just like we're not athletic we're the most unathletic people that you're going to meet and i'm no no i'm like yeah. no 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 i'm not saying you're athletes i'm saying that you are advocates for healthy active places and and that is 
an activity ambassador. It's an active living ambassador, natural activity, not exercise, not working out per se. It's like where your, your environment, your community just helps embrace you and gives you the hug that says, come on out, let's, you know, go for a walk, go for a bike. Yeah, it's easy. I mean, I'm sure I, I'm, I'm sure you know this, but you you don't actually need a lot of physical activity to get the health benefits of physical activity. Like you don't need to be pumping iron at the gym and and doing hard cardio all the time. Those things are great if you've got specific goals in mind for your health. But in terms of just staying healthy, like you just need to move. Like it's it, you just you need to move besides just from the the seat of your car to the seat at your desk at work. You know, it's it's. It's um, it's not even that difficult if the built environment is correct. And I mean, and it obviously it is here. I, I mean, it's it's funny because I, I joke to people that I, I made a video about um, grocery shopping very early on in the channel um, that, you know, if we have, you know, half dozen grocery stores within 500 meters of where we live. And and that's the case for m most city residents and and actually almost everyone in the country uh has a grocery store two at least two grocery stores within 500 meters of where they live through the whole country um but anyway in that video uh, i talked about how i would grocery shop by bicycle and uh, because one of the things that we got asked when we lived car free for a while in toronto the very first question anyone would ask us was but how do you buy groceries and we used to actually have a a uh car free living blog called but how do you buy groceries uh, for that reason um which is i mean it's comical that people think they literally can't think about how they would feed themselves without two tons of steel um but, but so then but, uh, but i'll interject you know it's yeah. it's like you you and i are sort of you know inside baseball and we're like yeah well of course you can do this and you had the international experience of being yeah. exposed to that they have literally never been exposed to the fact that it can be done. I mean, it really, yeah. I'm glad that you made that video. And I've, yeah. I've, uh, my, my, my good friend, Ryan Van Duzer, who I mentioned to you before we started recording, that's one of his most popular videos that he, you know, produced for his YouTube channel was mm. how he does grocery shopping in Boulder, right. Colorado. Yeah. I, it's, it's relevant. Just, it's just mind boggling to me. Um, yeah. that, I, but you know, it's not what, what's, crazy about it though is that i mean this was me until about 20 years ago when, when i started my channel my target audience was me 20 years ago um and I even referenced that in the first video that it was like I i'm targeting the person who is me i grew up in this sprawling suburb i was trapped as a child uh until i was 16 and could get my driver's license and finally like not be relying on my parents um i could not wait to get my own car uh, I could not even fathom the idea of living without a car. Like living without a car was being robbed of everything. Um, and, uh, and I mean, now I look back and I think that's insane. Like uh, where, where I live and where I have lived in many cities, living with a car would be a liability. Like I'd have to worry about it and pay to park it. And like, I, I don't even want it. Like, and, and actually the latest video I just made was about car sharing and how, and how, not only has it been cheaper for us, but it's also just less hassle. Like even if it wasn't cheaper, we would still do it because I don't want to worry about the car. Like I don't want to worry about it getting broken into or getting scratched or like having to pay for the insurance or any of that stuff. Um, so it, yeah, it's just, it's fascinating. But I mean, I, this is the thing I can understand because I used to be one of these people. Like I used to think exactly the same way because you grow up in an environment, you grow up in the environment that you grow up in, just like the Dutch people who were amazed by my channel. And you have no idea that it could be different and that it can be different. Um, and actually, just one more thing. Um, what I mentioned in that grocery store video, and the reason I was mentioning is that uh, I had mentioned that I, I grocery store, uh, grocery shop by bicycle, which just blows people's minds. Like, how do you grocery shop by bicycle? You know, you can't, you can't fit anything on a bicycle, which is obviously nonsense too. But, but what's funny is I now tell people, yeah, I, I don't grocery shop by bicycle anymore. And they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You can't grocery shop by bicycle. I said, no, because I walk to get my groceries. Like I only gross, like I only grocery shop by bicycle if I need to get a lot of stuff. Otherwise, I'm walking by the grocery store anyway, so it literally takes me only a couple of minutes to step inside, grab what I need for dinner, and, and step back out. Like, it's not even a trip. It's, it's literally just a minor detour. 
it's it's like if I have shot by a bicycle to go grocery shopping, I'm going to have to pass up a half dozen or more uh, grocery stores yeah. till I can get a decent ride in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I I do grocery shop by bicycle sometimes, but it's the one where it's yeah. like I'll take the the buck feeds cargo bike, and I'll and I'll go to the bigger grocery store and I'll and I'll buy you know all of the the, the canned goods and all that exactly. stuff that'll last a while. But I, most of the time, I don't I even want to shop by by bicycle because yeah. then you have to go and park it and lock it up and i don't want to bother with all that <laughs> yeah 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 that's that's great stuff so you referenced it a couple of different times the first video so i want to make sure yeah. that we uh for the listeners get that uh the title of that video right is is that the uh what makes a great city video yes i think it's something like that uh, if you go to um youtube.com slash not just bikes or actually not just bikes.com just bounces you there uh, I right. think it auto plays as soon as you hit the channel, but that was the oh, very okay. first. That was the very first video that I uploaded, and I mean that explains everything. It says, "Yeah, this is the yeah, video that's... I wish I could have seen 20 years ago because it would have saved me a lot of time." <laughs> exactly, and, and I've got it up on my screen here, so I can actually see that oh, yeah. the uh, the the grocery store uh, video, which is a, a couple more over, is uh, is at 603 thousand views <laughs> I know, right so is the that the most is, viewed video? no the most viewed is actually my dutch bicycles um video which uh -huh. is also not expected so when i make videos i have like what i think are like headline videos so like when i made right. the growth ponzi scheme i put a lot of effort into it and i put like graphs in it and all this animated stuff and i was like no this is this is the big video right and i spend right, right. a lot of time on it and i know i'm going to get a bunch of hate mail from suburbanites on it and all that so you know i uh, that's that's a big deal and then I make these kind of in-between videos um, to introduce sort of more, what I consider more minor subjects, but I think are important to sort of flesh things out, but also yeah. for my own sanity so that I can do something a little more lighthearted, you know, maybe get a little less hate mail from the suburbanites. And uh, and the Dutch bicycles was supposed to be an in-between video, just about, hey, yeah. this is what Dutch bicycles are like. And though that's the most popular video on the channel. So one thing I've learned from this whole experience is I have no idea what people are going to be interested in. Like, <laughs> absolutely no idea. Like, I cannot predict how a video is going to do at any at all. Like, I don't know. I don't know. So, well, I, so basically, I, I mean, I chat with my Patreons sometimes, but for the most part, I just say, like, this is the stuff I got in my head right now. This is what I'm thinking about. I'm going to make a video about it. See what happens because, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and what's, what's funny is, is, and I know this because I read uh, some of your comments about this is that uh, sometimes, you know, the, the algorithms ha have a, a big impact on what gets viewed too. So yeah. you had mentioned yeah. that uh, the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm, you know, sort of boosted your 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 uh garbage video yeah. and so suddenly trash pickup video was like one of the most popular in fact it's number three on your list right now is it yeah i you know what while we're, we're sitting here i should very quickly pull this up. i should i should know these things so yeah so um dutch bikes are better seven hundred seventy three thousand views i mean that's just mind-boggling it, it i i can see the stats on the on the path that it's on it's going to hit a million in the, in probably about two or three months which for me to think that I've made a piece of content that has been viewed a million times is just mind boggling, absolutely mind boggling. Um, but, uh, but you know, the thing is there, there, I mean, there's an appetite for this stuff and I guess I shouldn't be surprised because after my, you know, my world travel experience, my fateful walk in Houston, I got interested in this stuff. Um, and, uh, and then when I, when I did, I, I almost, I couldn't unsee it. Every, every place I went to, I was spotting all of these different elements and these different things. And it, it was, it was fascinating, but it's also, uh, I, I will warn anybody that starts watching this content of mine or anybody else's. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like, unfortunately, once you learn about like Strodes and why they're bad from strong towns or from my videos about strong towns, you're going to go out to the Strode near you and you're going to be like, this is garbage. Like I used to just drive on this and you know, tune out and listen to the radio or something. And now I'm going to look at this and think, this is horrible. We need to do something about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so true. It's so true. I, I think one of my first exposures to your videos was probably your number two video, which was why yeah. cars rarely crash into buildings in the, in the Netherlands. Yeah. 
Um, and, 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 and just, just so we can make this about me, uh, <laughs> I, I will, I will, uh, uh, remind you that probably one of my first, uh, interactions with you was when I, uh, when I actually published and posted the, uh, interview with Aaron Riediger, uh, about Dutch bikes. It was the plain bicycle, uh, right. you know, you know, culture right. bomb. And, and so I, when I built the landing page for that episode, I made sure that, uh, your upright Dutch bicycles uh, video was embedded on the Active Towns, uh, you know, podcast episode for Aaron's episode. So I, I'm sure that it was her immense popularity and, <laughs> and the people going to the website that helped Absolutely. propel that video to the top. Well, yeah. that totally explains it. So yeah, I told you yeah. I didn't think it was going to be a big video, and it was. And obviously, I know now it's because it was Boom. linked by Active Towns. Well, what's neat is is you're producing content that I keep referencing back to because i've already uh twice now uh referenced the the new strode video right uh for for strong towns and right. and, and that's uh, i mean that's i guess the whole point and you had mentioned it earlier is it's not just a guy or two guys or a bunch of talking heads just talking about stuff as we are right now on this podcast <laughs> if you're listening to just the audio vision <laughs> version of this podcast Go to the landing page. We'll have some video there. There'll be some photos there. But a lot of people do take this information in audio wise. Maybe they're doing something else. Maybe they're going for a walk. Maybe they're working in the yard. Uh, and so, you know, that, that opportunity to do that. But you're so absolutely right. The visuals are so powerful. Yeah. And it's great to have another content producer out there that's like, producing something that's like spot on oh somebody referenced strode i'm going to make sure that that video is embedded into this content so that people can reference and and, and be able to understand yeah. uh, because a lot of this is wonky um so getting back to the the point that that was your aha moment you were in houston just down the road from me here in austin texas and uh, it hit you upside the head, like literally. This was a bad, bad environment. Thankfully, nothing hit me upside the head, literally, that, literally. Uh, that day, because that would have been a big problem, but it, it could have. It could have. So what was that next step? I mean, did you just start immersing yourself in urbanism? Uh, what, was that, what was that sort of, you know? Well, remember, uh, this is the time in my life when I was on an airplane all the time. Like, I, I traveled more than almost anybody that I've ever met is I had I had gold status on two different airlines at the same time so I had a lot of time to read and that's what I did and I, I would read um, I would read uh, mostly books but occasionally I would read blogs too you know I might uh, you know download some stuff to read on the plane or something what like was that. the most impactful book that you can think back to that era and said this you know really makes sense now and then that led well, to another thing and another. yeah i mean one of them that maybe not so much about urban planning but one that's actually very important and one that i've been thinking i really have to make a video about is um is there's a book called high and mighty that was written by a detroit um auto journalist about um the history of the suv and uh man that screwed up like it's it was literally only created to get around um fuel efficiency standards and it was heavily promoted for that reason. And and it's just, it's such a sad story, to be honest, because SUVs have completely screwed us in so many ways um, from them being way more dangerous um, to people driving, certainly to pedestrians, the, the uh, fuel efficiency implications. I mean, just, uh, I mean, they've just been horrible all around. So that was one of those ones that I read and I was just like, oh damn, this is not good. And SUVs have only become significantly worse since then, because I think that book was written like 15 years ago or something like that. Right, right. Um, Can you recall from that book are the quote unquote light trucks like the, the Ford F-150? Is that also considered in that category? Yeah, it was all in light don't... trucks. So basically the very brief history, keeping in mind that I haven't read this book in like 10 years, um, the very brief history was that uh, uh, there were these uh, fuel efficiency standards that were put in the CAFE standards, the Combined Average Fuel Efficiency Standards, CAFA. And, um, and they were supposed to be basically a, a manufacturer had to have an average fuel efficiency for the whole range. Um, and originally, I actually remember this from when I lived in California in the late 90s, and EVs were a big thing. And EVs are another one that just 
drive me nuts because I was living in California when the EV1 was there and I saw them all over the place and they were chargers at Fry's Electronics and I figured we'd all be driving EVs in 10 years and guess what? We weren't. Um, so, um, but anyway, uh, so you had to have this combined average fuel efficiency across your whole product line. And that was the important part is that you couldn't just, you know, have a couple of fuel efficient vehicles and then mostly sell a bunch of, of, of uh, fuel inefficient vehicles. But the one thing that happened uh, after like heavy lobbying by the auto industry was for them to exempt light trucks. And, um, and that was, it was all sold under, oh, boohoo, you know, all these, you know, these, these farmers and, and these, these, these trades workers with their light trucks are going to have to pay more and they're all going to go out of business, boohoo. And, um, and so they exempted light trucks from the average fuel efficiency standard. So what happens? The manufacturers just said, well, let's cram as many sales as possible into this exempted category. Just whatever we can do, cram it into the exempted category. And that's where the SUV came from. I mean, there were SUVs before this, like the Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee, but you know, they were sold to the people that actually needed them, which is like a 10th of a 10th of a 10th of 1% of the population. Um, but after that, they had every motivation possible to, to promote the hell out of light trucks. And, and that's where it all came from. And the implications of that have just been just awful. Well, we're, we're definitely seeing that, you know, in the fatality rates here in, in North America, where we see the fatality rates, uh, you know, in for the occupants of the motor vehicles have been relatively flat, if not decreasing. And yet, uh, we're starting to see the uptick in the fatality rates of, of pedestrians and, and people outside. Yeah, a massive uptick since, uh, since about 2009. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's not entirely due to SUVs, but it's, it's, a, nope. it's a big part of it. It's speed is a big part of it, too. And speed yeah. and, and but, so, you know, the thing is, though, yeah. it's, when it comes to a crash, it's not about speed. It's about momentum, which is speed right. times, times the mass. And the, the, mass, the higher yeah. mass vehicles, the higher yeah. weight vehicles, are, uh, contribute to that. So even yeah. at lower speeds, SUVs are more... I mean, it's just this is a whole other issue, but boy. Yeah, yeah that was one book that I was just like, oh, damn, this is just... I had no idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. Did you ever read uh, the book Traffic by Tom Vanderbilt? No, I actually never got around to reading it. It's one of those ones that I got on the e ebook reader and just never got around to it. So yeah, I really yeah. should. Um, yeah, but why? Good, it, why in particular do you say that? Oh, it's it's just a no. It was one of the earlier books that you know that that I sort of dove into, and it and it sort of you know started to be just another one of those uh, self-reinforcing things. It's like, oh, okay, this is starting to make more sense. I think that's when I first uh, w realized that, uh, you know, some of the psychology behind uh, driver behavior and things of that nature. So yeah, if you, if you have it uh, and it's just kind of sitting there, uh, I think it's worth it. It's, it's a little dated now. It's, it's, you know, it was probably a decade ago, but it's still a great book. So... Yeah, good stuff. And speaking of books, now earlier you had mentioned that you know low levels of activity are sufficient for health uh, implications and, and health improvement. And you're absolutely right. Uh, Peter Walker's new book, Miracle Pill, he talks a lot about this, and uh, it, it's it's that concept that hey, uh, humans are not meant to be sedentary. Yeah. And when we are, bad things happen. Yeah. And so even just that, like you said, just going out, doing your normal business, going about your day and, you know, wow, 200 or, you know, 25, 25 kilometers 25 worth kilometers, of, yeah. of, uh, <laughs> of movement on the bike. And yeah. it, it's it's that, you know, natural, unplanned activity that really helps, you know, reinforce healthy active lifestyles and you're absolutely right you mentioned you know it, it's not that exercise is unhealthy yes and, and peter talks about this in his book it's like if you are able to to get a little bit more exertion in you will benefit from it yeah. for sure but you don't have to and so you don't that barrier that friction doesn't have to be there it could be just you know taking advantage of our built environment and uh you're you're in the middle of it. So we talked a little bit about the most popular videos that uh, have, have really trended. What's your most popular video? Of mine or anybody's? Yeah, no, um, your, of yours. You know, of mine. Either, either, you know, either the one that you, you know, just 
really were most satisfied with personally <laughs> or you're, you're just like and who knows maybe it's not the most popular yeah i mean i don't know it's a good it's a good question there's there's a lot of them that i like i mean i wouldn't have made them if i don't like them because it's not like i'm on any kind of schedule well i try to stick myself to a schedule otherwise i'll never get anything done but it's not like anyone's holding me to a schedule i should say even my patreons if i slip they're like yeah it's fine dude whatever take your time so <laughs> so um, I've never made anything that I don't like. Um, one of the ones, uh, so maybe I'll give an example of one that's not as popular as I wish it were, uh, which is um, I made a video, uh, not too fancy, it's just called uh, Do Your Buses Get Stuck in Traffic? And um, that's one that I think the message of it is very important. It's not a very popular video because a lot of people don't really care about buses. Um, you know, there are lots of train people. I'm a train person. I love my trains. I love trams. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of people who love buses, um, so maybe it just doesn't capture people's attention. But Do Your Buses Get Stuck in Traffic is ultimately about, um, well, ultimately about an urban planning concept called the Downs-Thompson Paradox, but which is that um, basically, th this is not the way it's structured, but it basically says people will take the fastest and most efficient or most convenient in some cases way to get to where they're going. That's it. It's very simple. Um, and I think it's really lost on people uh, when they're looking at designing cities. North American cities, this this traffic engineering, I mean, this is, you know, going back to any strong town stuff, this traffic engineering just fixation on moving as many vehicles as possible is just so incredibly brain dead because you are not moving vehicles. There's nothing to do with vehicles. You're moving people. The, it is irrelevant as to how they get there. Um, and as soon as you start focusing on moving people instead of moving cars, um, you you change the the way the math works out. And so, do your buses get stuck in traffic? The whole idea is a city where buses get stuck in traffic sucks. Like this is literally one of these things that I have used when I when I even when I you know when I started learning about urban travel um, urban planning and I was traveling around the world. This is one of these things I noticed that it's like if your buses get stuck in traffic, your city sucks because this is a this is a, a sort of metric for what your city finds is important. Like, does your city care about moving people? Um, does your city care about public transport users? Or are they only concerned about the people who are in cars? Because if you're on a bus and it gets stuck in traffic, what, nobody's going to take the bus. Like, if you have money for a car, you will get a car. Like, there's literally no reason why you wouldn't do such a thing. And I remember this from growing up in London, Ontario, before I could drive. I remember waiting for the bus that was supposed to come every 45 minutes, and it just didn't, right? It just didn't show up. And when it did show up eventually, you know, another 45 minutes later, it would just get stuck in traffic with the cars. So, you know, it, it was awful. And, um, and as soon as, and public transit that gets stuck in traffic will not actually be effective. It's not useful. It's basically, you're basically saying public transit is going to be for the poor and the desperate who can't drive or can't afford to drive. And that's it. <clears throat> the whole point of public transit, from my point of view, is that it should be an efficient way to get around. Uh, public transit moves, even the simple bus moves crazy amounts of people, huge amounts of people, and very efficiently too. And so when you give buses their own lane, when you give them signal priority, um, it becomes a desirable way to travel because the truth is there's lots of, there's lots of car people and train people and bike people, but most people don't care. Most people really don't care. Like if people say they like their cars, most people don't even like their cars because they like cars. They like their car because their car gets them to where they want to go. Just the way I did when I was 16 and I got a car, boy, I like cars because the car finally gave me the freedom to get to where I was going. But it did that because of the way my city was designed. Um, you know, if, if the bus was coming every five to 10 minutes and the bus had its own lane and would speed by the cars, I wouldn't like cars. I wouldn't even care. And, and that's the situation that you see here in the Netherlands is that um, there are so many uh, priority uh, bus lanes, priority tram lanes, and that's the only way public transit can really work because as soon as then it becomes a faster and efficient way, it doesn't have to be for everyone, it just has to be for a segment of the population. As soon as the bus or the tram becomes faster, people are going to take it. The people who don't care about how they get around. The people who just say, look, I just want to get to where I'm going, and this will get me there five minutes faster, so I'm going to do it. And as soon as that happens, everything else around it just becomes better. Because then, and, and this is something that, um, that I'm working on in a video as well, like 
it's great to drive in the Netherlands. Like it's fantastic to drive in the Netherlands. And I've put out videos about traffic calming and I get all this people got, oh, I would hate that. It would be the worst place in the world. Give me my, my six lane roads in Florida. And, and it was funny. There's actually a video that I saw and I wish I could remember who, who did it, but, uh, there was a video, uh, on YouTube, just random vlogger guy, not related to urban planning at all. Guy who moved from Florida to the Netherlands loves driving. He, he makes videos about cars. And he made a video about how much he loves driving in the Netherlands compared to Florida. And it's because... Well, and, it's, and it's, not just the, it's not just that guy. I mean, they are actually are rated as the world's yes, they are. most satisfied yeah. drivers. They yeah. are. Yeah. And the Waze data backs this up too. Like the Netherlands is the best country in the world to drive. And the reason for that is because the only people who drive are the people who want to drive or the people who need to drive. And that's it. Anybody that doesn't want to drive or doesn't need to drive isn't driving. And... When you get rid of all the people who don't want to be in their cars, things are better for everybody. And, you know, if, if I, I don't personally enjoy driving very much, I do it, but I, it's, I would rather sit and read a book or something, right? I, I don't like having to pay attention and being worried that I'm going to kill somebody or myself or both. Um, <clears throat> so I would gladly take a tram, even if it's a little bit longer, to be honest. <clears throat> but, um, but that's not an option. In, in, like if I'm in Toronto, for instance, and I hop on the streetcar, well, it, it's just going to get stuck in traffic with cars. So I, I have a choice. And, and then it's, of course, going to stop and let people off and everything else. So I have a choice. Do, do I want to sit on the tram for 40 minutes or do I want to drive for 15 minutes or 20 minutes? And I think even I, as a tram lover, um, I'm going to look at this and say, no, I'm going to drive. Are you crazy? But the only reason for that is because the, the streetcars are stuck in traffic. And getting back to the, the bus video, which, by the way, we're going to propel the, this bus video into a much more powerful. <laughs> oh, you so watch this out is the Dutch challenge. bicycles. <laughs> this, is the, this is the challenge, you, you Active Towns podcast listeners. And I know there's a few of you out there that are, are, are passionate uh, transit folks. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's boost this uh, bus video up there. But one of the biggest challenges that we have is that uh, we don't even treat bus riders with dignity. No, I, mean, I know. The, it's disgraceful, actually, in, in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, you know, the stick in the mud, you know, bus stop. And, and, and this gets back to part of the success from an active mobility perspective is that the Dutch are continually fine-tuning and tweaking and working on the, the quality of the bicycle network. It's never complete. It's never yeah. perfect. And so they're always tinkering with it and saying, how can we make this a more dignified experience? How can we make this more comfortable for everyone? And, and that's part of the reason why the system is working as well as it is and continues to get better and better. And in fact, uh, Mark with Bicycle Dutch uh, just you know, posted a wonderful 10-year comparison right, on uh, of, of Utrecht. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah it's, um, it, and it was fantastic because... That is very much a part of that spirit of saying, you know, we have to treat people with, with dignity if we expect that they're not going to jump in a car. Yeah, actually, this is something I was talking about when I was on the radio with NPO Radio Ain here, um, that uh, all of this is very fragile, to be honest, because um, and, and they've seen it in certain parts of the Netherlands where they've, they've slipped up a bit. If you've got bicycle pass, but then there's a section where actually, you know, you've gone and you've prioritized cars and now it's really busy and now it's hard to cross. Somebody's going to stop cycling. Somebody somewhere is going to stop cycling, you know, and, and it'll probably be on the periphery. It'll all either be like a, a kid or a parent with young children, or it'll be a senior. And, but somebody is going to stop cycling because of that. They're going to, they're going to hit this rough patch. They're going to feel uncomfortable. They're going to be a bit too close to a car or something. And, you know, your, 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 your mother, or your grandmother is going to be like, you know, I, no, I, I can't do this anymore. And, and well, and, and Jason, I'll, I'll jump in and say, it, and, and I'll extend that out to not just about bikes of saying, yeah. if the experience that somebody has of walking down that street uh, is, is uncomfortable and unsafe, you know, they might be less likely to, to, to take transit. They might be less yeah. likely to, you know, jump on the train. They, they may be incentivized to, you know, say, Hey, you know what, that car that 
sits in the garage or parked most of the time because they actually do have quite high you know car ownership levels the dutch do it's yes like, absolutely yeah they, they might just go ahead and say you know we're going to drive because mm -hmm. it that experience wasn't there so you're in amsterdam and amsterdam does have a challenge they have a challenge of the density that they are and the overwhelming number of bikes that you know pro proliferate in the public spaces mm -hmm. and so you know trying to you know trying to make sure that they you know deal with the amount of bikes that are on the streets especially in the most uh, congested areas is there so again another example that i give of you know they're they're tinkering with that they're trying to think through ways of of dealing with uh hey we've got a problem it's a good problem <laughs> too many bikes. yeah there are certainly worse problems to have yeah there's worse problems to have but the point being is that when it comes to that public realm it's got to be safe and comfortable and convenient for people and it's not safe or comfortable and convenient if you're you know Maybe you're you're you know somebody who's in a wheelchair or somebody who is you know inconvenienced by you know a whole bunch of bikes that are you know blocking your door to get into your your apartment. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you really want to leave the listeners with? <laughs> well, I mean, there is. I guess there's one thing. Uh, maybe it's too depressing to end on, but. <laughs> One That's all right. Things. I have another one, so you can <laughs> do right, the depressing one. All right, okay, so I'll one, do the so. depressing one, and then you, let's do something a little happier at the end. So one of the things that I get a lot uh, now that the channel has become quite successful is I get a lot of people saying to me, oh, my God, you've opened my eyes to all this. How can I make it better where I live? And um, that is the hardest question for me to answer, to be honest. Um, and I, I usually send people to Strong Towns for what it's worth because I think the work that Strong Towns is doing is the probably the most likely to lead to success going back to traditional mixed use development and really focusing on downtown areas that are productive and things like that um but uh but that's a hard question for me to answer because the the truth of the matter is i left right like i looked at the situation where i was from and i said this is this is not going to work like, there's no solution to this in my lifetime. So I literally, like, packed up my whole family and left. So uh, it's always hard for me to answer that question. And I know I get it all the time. I get it literally every day, some, multiple times a day, um, if, I, if I read the YouTube comments, which I usually don't after a few days because it becomes, like, just brain-dead conspiracy theories after a while. But, um, but I have a hard time answering that question. So to anybody listening who wants me to answer that question, I go to Strong Towns because I can't answer it. And I, honestly, I would be a hypocrite if I was trying to give you um, solutions to that because I couldn't find solutions. I'm I'm not an advocate. Like uh, my wife's the advocate. I'm uh, I'm the guy that like looks at all the data and thinks, okay, well if we present all the data, to everybody, they'll all agree and we'll all jump on board. No, they're not going to do that. <laughs> so anyway, that's the biggest challenge I have right now is that I feel like the channel is is becoming, um, well, certainly as I introduce urban planning concepts, it's just becoming too negative. Um, and, uh, and it's just negativity after negativity after negativity, because unfortunately, it was all of that negativity that drove me to say, I can't do this anymore, I need to leave. Um, so that's, that's the truth of my experience. So eventually I'm going to have to, to turn the, the channel into talking about sort of what's working here at least and talking about things in the Netherlands, although I don't know how much interest there's going to be on that. I mean, certainly that's something that uh, Bicycle Dutch does very well. Uh, as you said about the 10 years of Utrecht, it's a great video about the, the things that they've done here. But anyway, that's the one thing I, I want to say. I, I can't answer that question except go check out Strong Towns. And, and I mean, Active Towns podcast too, to be honest. I mean, the stuff that you guys talk about here, you, you talk about what some people are doing in the U.S. and some grassroots movements um, that are going on. And, and I think that's ultimately the solution. It's going to be long and it's going to be difficult, but let's, if, you're, if you're in, if you've got your roots dug, then that's, that's the path to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I would actually push back on you a little bit and challenge you a little bit yeah. here in the sense that I think that what you are producing, the content that you are producing, is 
partly those solutions because you're talking about these things and you're talking about them in a nice compare and contrast way. Mm -hmm. And so it may not be prescriptive. It may not be. Yeah, well, it's certainly not prescriptive. No, but it is. Okay. But it does open people's eyes to this. Here's what the problem is. So at least you can focus your attention on it. If you're the type of person who is more of an activist than I am. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And mm-hmm. and you're absolutely right. You know, Strong Towns, the Strong Towns movement is a wonderful uh, resource to go to, and it'll go deep into a whole bunch of, of, of other subjects, uh, you know, about the, you know, the problems as they exist, you know, especially from a North American context of, you know, the, what happened post-World War II and mm-hmm. the Ponzi scheme of how, mm-hmm. you know, really the suburban development, you know, kind of took over. Uh, and, and, and you're absolutely right. Mark with Bicycle Dutch, great resource and many, many years worth of content. Another great resource is Street Films, Clarence Eckerson Jr. Yeah. Uh, he's up to no, almost a thousand films at this point on, on his uh, channel and uh, has wonderful content and interviews about things that are happening and ideas of you know how things can happen. At the the bottom line, though, is that, and, and and this is this is your story, is you have to care, you have to get engaged, and you have to do something. For you, that something was moving to the move, Netherlands, yeah. <laughs> moving to the Netherlands. Step one, <laughs> step two, talking about it and talking about it visually and creating yeah. a YouTube channel, and and now becoming. I'm anointing you an activity ambassador and a YouTube star. There you go. Thank you so much. You know, I get recognized on the street. I don't even know how that's possible. I don't even show my face that often in my videos, and I get recognized on the street. Yeah. Hey, I. you deserve it. You're doing great work. <laughs> Keep it up. And once again, how can people find you? Um, well, the best place is YouTube, obviously. Um, you can go search on YouTube for Nonchus Bikes. I mean, if you search any platform for Nonchus Bikes, I'm going to pop up. There's a subreddit. Um, there's a uh, there's the, the Twitter. Um, there's It's everything. Nonchusbikes.com bumps you to the YouTube channel. That, anyway, Nonchus Bikes seems to be everywhere these days. I can't get away from it. And you mentioned earlier that you have a Patreon, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. so uh, I have a Patreon as well if you'd like to support the channel. Uh, it's patreon.com slash notjustbikes. And I guess there is the one other channel, the um, NJB Live, which I have a second YouTube channel called NJB Live, where I live stream bicycle rides. So for people that really want to see the nitty gritty of, uh, or maybe get a bit jealous of, of how things work here, I do bicycle rides in and around Amsterdam and hopefully in other cities too after the, the travel restrictions let up where I ride on a bike and I have the camera pointed to, to where I'm going and uh, interact with the chat and talk to people about what we're seeing. And, and I think um, to certain people that they love that kind of content and, uh, because what I find interesting about riding around on a bicycle and live streaming it is that uh, I can go anywhere. I can go literally anywhere and it's always going to be safe. And that's something that just cannot be appreciated enough. Because I think some people might even look at Amsterdam and think, oh, yeah, they have these bike lanes here and this is the touristy area there. But like, surely when you go out to the industrial park, it's just going to be a bunch of trucks. And no, I mean, I've done bike rides out to industrial parks and I'm like, no, look at this. It's a fantastic beats pad. And I take a different, more direct route to get here than the cars and trucks do. And when I get here, it's completely safe and there's traffic calming, even in an industrial park with a bunch of warehouses. So I think if you're interested in seeing some of that, you can check out NJB Live and see what it looks like all over. Because I really try to cover the city, every last little piece of it, to show you uh, to what it looks like. And uh, for that particular platform, uh, when you are out there doing it, are you interacting with folks live? Yes, I am, absolutely. So I read the chat um, when possible. I usually ride a bit slower and have it big on the, on the, on the, the handlebars there so I can read it. Um, and, and yeah, it's actually, it's a, a, it's a good time because people can ask some questions to me or about the city or what they're seeing, um, anything uh, like that. And, uh, and and it actually becomes quite interesting. So I I get between about a hundred to 150 people at a time, um, on there and, uh, and and it's pretty good. So come check that out if that's something that would interest you. There you go, folks. So not just bikes out on YouTube and also NJB live, check Jason out. 
That's great. Hey, Jason, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active you, Tense podcast. Thanks so much. It was great. Thank you all so very much for tuning in to episode number 82 of the Active Towns podcast. I sure hope you enjoyed this fun chat with Jason Slaughter as much as I did. It's really amazing how the Not Just Bikes channel has taken off, and I choose to believe that this is an indication that people around the globe are ready for change and ready for more people-oriented places. And why not? If not now, then when? I encourage you all to explore Jason's work, both his Not Just Bikes and the NJB Live channels. I've included all the relevant links in the show notes as well as out on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. Also, the landing page will feature many of the videos we discussed embedded for your easy viewing pleasure. Okay, here's my final fundraising plug. Well, at least for this episode anyways. (laughs) Seriously, though, if you've enjoyed this episode and appreciate my efforts to profile the inspiring advances happening around the globe to promote active living and active mobility, please help me out by making a tax-deductible contribution to Active Towns. Each and every donation is truly appreciated and really does make a huge difference in allowing me the ability to continue producing this content and growing the culture of activity movement. I've made doing so super easy. Just click on the link in the show notes or go to activetowns.org and navigate over to the donation page. Thank you all so very much for your support and for tuning in. That's all for this week's episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>